Welcome to a voyage back in time, to the very dawn of Britain. Our journey unravels the landscape of human history from the icy grips of the Paleolithic era, through the monumental Neolithic Revolution, the gleaming Bronze Age, and into the formidable Iron Age. With each step, we'll uncover the layers of human ingenuity, resilience, and transformation that have sculpted the British Isles through millennia. Prepare to delve into the mysteries and milestones of prehistoric Britain, where each stone, artifact, and landscape tells a story of survival, innovation, and the indomitable human spirit. In the deep recesses of time, before Britain was an island, the first humans set foot on this land over 800,000 years ago. These pioneering hunter-gatherers braved the harsh glacial landscapes of the Paleolithic era, a world of ice and stone where survival hinged on their wits and will. Armed with nothing but simple stone tools, they embarked on a daily struggle against the elements, hunting the colossal woolly mammoths and fishing in the icy rivers that carved through the terrain. This was a time of beginnings where the story of Britain and humanity's place within it starts to unfold. As the grip of the Ice Ages waned, the world warmed, setting the stage for a remarkable transformation around 10,000 BC. The vast glaciers that once dominated the British landscape began their slow retreat, revealing the contours of a land waiting to be rediscovered. This awakening of the earth was a spectacle of nature's resilience, as forests sprouted from the thawing soil and rivers carved their paths through the verdant land. It was a canvas of green, painted with the broad strokes of nature's hand, signaling the dawn of a new era in Britain's story. Attracted by the promise of a land reborn, hunter-gatherers of the Mesolithic period began their migration into the heart of this transformed Britain. These intrepid people, skilled in the ways of the wild, found themselves in a world teeming with life and opportunity. As they ventured into dense forests and along the banks of the newly formed rivers, their connection to the land deepened. Each day brought new discoveries, vast herds of deer, schools of fish in crystal clear waters, and the rich bounty of the forests. In this land of plenty, the foundations for a new way of life were laid as people adapted to the rhythms and riches of their verdant home. The Mesolithic hunter-gatherers, faced with the abundance of a warming world, honed their skills and knowledge to thrive. Their tools, crafted with precision from flint, became more sophisticated. Axes to fell trees, spears for hunting, and scrapers to prepare hides. Fire, their greatest ally, provided warmth, protection, and a means to cook the bounty of the land. Life in this era was communal, with families and tribes gathering together to share in the fruits of their labor. Their existence showcased human ingenuity, living in harmony with the land that sustained them. The Mesolithic period was not just a time of survival, but of profound spiritual significance. The people of this age viewed themselves as part of the intricate web of life, a belief reflected in their art and rituals. Cave paintings and carved figurines served as totems of their reverence for the natural world, capturing the essence of the animals they hunted and the landscapes they called home. Ceremonial sites, marked by simple stone arrangements, hosted gatherings where the community came together to celebrate the cycles of nature and the heavens above. These practices, rooted in the wisdom of their ancestors, reinforced their bond with the earth and the unseen forces that shaped their world. In this renewed world, the Mesolithic hunter-gatherers thrived. With the ice gone, they embraced the bounty of the forests and rivers, devising more sophisticated flint tools to better hunt, fish and forage. Life in Mesolithic Britain was one of movement and rhythm with nature, their existence woven into the fabric of the land. Communities formed around the waterways, the lifeblood of this ancient world, where stories and skills were shared beside crackling fires under the canopy of stars. These were the first architects of the British landscape, whose legacy is not written in stone, but in the persistence of human ingenuity and adaptation. Around 4000 BC, as the Mesolithic era faded into the annals of history, a monumental shift heralded the beginning of the Neolithic period. This was the advent of agriculture, a revolution that forever changed humanity's relationship with the earth. Across Britain, the once nomadic hunter-gatherers began to settle, turning the wild lands into cultivated fields and pastures. Families sowed the seeds of the first crops and domesticated animals, binding their lives to the cycles of planting and harvest. 
This was not merely a change in livelihood, but the birth of civilization itself, as communities formed around these nascent farms, laying down the roots of the first permanent settlements. With the advent of agriculture, the Neolithic period saw the emergence of closely knit communities across Britain. These early farmers built the first permanent homes from timber and thatch, creating villages that became the heartbeats of Neolithic society. Life was centered around the communal fields and pastures, where the collective effort of planting and harvesting forged strong bonds among the inhabitants. These communities were more than mere gatherings of people. They were the foundation stones of society, places where knowledge, traditions and beliefs were shared and preserved. In these gatherings, under the open sky or around the warmth of a fire, the cultural legacy of Neolithic Britain was woven. The Neolithic period was a time of remarkable innovation. The early farmers of Britain honed their skills, crafting flint into more sophisticated tools and giving shape to the first pottery, capturing the essence of their daily lives. The invention of the plough marked a turning point in agriculture, allowing them to cultivate larger areas of land more efficiently. But perhaps their most enduring legacy was their mastery over stone. This era saw the beginning of megalithic construction as communities came together to create monumental structures that dotted the landscape. These feats of engineering and cooperation were profound expressions of their worldviews, marking the landscape with symbols of their connection to the earth and each other. In the heart of a lush, verdant landscape, the first steps toward creating Stonehenge began, not with stone, but with wood and earth. Communities came together, marking out a circular ditch and bank and erecting timber structures that served as the early blueprint for what would become Stonehenge. This initial phase laid the spiritual and physical foundations for a project that would span generations, a communal endeavor that merged the efforts of countless individuals united in a common purpose. It was here in these early acts of construction that the deep spiritual connection of the Neolithic people to their land and the cosmos above began to take physical form. As the vision of Stonehenge evolved, so too did the ambition of its builders. The transformation from wood to stone marked a pivotal moment in its construction. From the Preseli Hills in Wales and nearby quarries, massive sarsen stones and smaller bluestones began their long journey to Stonehenge. This monumental task required not just brute strength, but sophisticated knowledge of engineering and a deep understanding of the landscape. The effort to transport these stones some weighing as much as 25 tons. Over vast distances showcases the extraordinary determination and communal spirit of the Neolithic people. United by a common goal, they embarked on an endeavor that would echo through the ages. With the stones at their destination, the builders of Stonehenge embarked on the task of raising them to create the iconic trilithons and circle that awe us today. This phase was characterized by an incredible precision that went beyond mere construction. It was an act of aligning the earthly with the celestial. The precise positioning of the stones to align with the solstices demonstrated a sophisticated understanding of astronomy. At the summer solstice, the sun rises in perfect alignment with the heel stone, its first rays illuminating the central altar, a moment of cosmic synergy, celebrating the unbreakable bond between the earth and the heavens. Stonehenge was a temple to the cosmos, a place where people could connect with the cycles of the universe and the passage of time. Around 2500 BC, a revolutionary discovery ignites the dawn of the Bronze Age in Britain. The mastery of fire and metalworking, specifically the creation of bronze through the alloying of copper and tin, marks a pivotal turn in the story of human civilization. This innovation ushers in an era where metal becomes the backbone of society. Bronze tools and weapons far superior to their stone predecessors, emerge as symbols of power and prestige, heralding the rise of new social hierarchies and the birth of warrior elites. The glow of the furnace becomes a beacon of progress, casting light on the boundless potential of human ingenuity. With the advent of bronze, a new social order takes root across Britain. The ability to wield and control this precious resource becomes a measure of power and authority, giving rise to warrior elites and chieftains. These formidable figures, armed with bronze swords and shields, stand at the pinnacle of society, their status immortalized in death as much as in life. Lavish burial mounds rise from the earth, 
elaborate tombs filled with treasures and bronze artifacts, signaling the wealth and prestige of these early leaders. Hill forts, majestic and imposing, dot the landscape, serving as bastions of power and community hubs in an age defined by metal and might. The Bronze Age is one of expanding horizons. Britain's shores open to the wider world through burgeoning trade networks, establishing the island as a vital nexus in a vast web of exchange. Boats, heavy with cargoes of bronze, gold, amber and tin, crisscross the seas, connecting British communities with distant civilizations in the Mediterranean, Scandinavia and beyond. This era of interaction fosters not only the exchange of goods, but also of ideas, cultures and technologies, weaving the fabric of British society with threads from far-off lands. Trade routes become conduits of innovation, driving social and economic growth across the island. The soil of Britain, once tilled and defended by Bronze Age hands, yields beautifully crafted artefacts, jewellery of intricate design, weapons of formidable craftsmanship, and ceremonial objects imbued with unknown significance. These relics, unearthed from ancient burial sites and long abandoned settlements, offer a glimpse into a world where metalworking elevated society, creating distinctions of status and power. Modern archaeologists and historians pore over these discoveries, piecing together the puzzles of the past. As we transition into the Iron Age around 800 BC, a new chapter unfolds in Britain's storied history. Iron, a metal stronger and more abundant than bronze, emerges as the cornerstone of societal advancement. The discovery of iron smelting marks a revolutionary leap forward, transforming not only warfare and agriculture, but the very fabric of daily life. Blacksmiths become the architects of change, forging tools, weapons and implements that surpass their bronze counterparts in durability and efficiency. This era of innovation propels the communities of Britain into a future defined by greater potential for cultivation, combat and craftsmanship. In the Iron Age, the landscape of Britain becomes dotted with imposing hill forts, symbols of power and protection. These formidable strongholds, strategically perched on high ground, offer a vantage point against invaders and a refuge for their inhabitants. The construction of these forts, with massive earthworks and wooden palisades, highlights the organizational and engineering prowess of Iron Age communities. Within these protective walls, life flourishes. Hill forts become bustling centers for trade, governance and social life. They stand as a clear signal of a society that, while open to the benefits of trade and cultural exchange, remains vigilant and prepared to defend its achievements. The Iron Age ushers in an era of profound societal transformation, the widespread use of iron plows and tools revolutionizes agriculture, enabling communities to cultivate the land with unprecedented efficiency. Life within the hill forts is vibrant and diverse, characterized by a strong sense of community. Communal feasts celebrate the harvests, while religious rituals, overseen by the revered Druids, connect the people to their gods and the natural world. Trade flourishes, not only within the confines of each fort, but also between neighboring communities and distant lands, facilitated by the improved tools and weapons of the era. This is a time of dynamic social structures where roles and relationships are defined by contributions to community and defense. As the material of choice shifts to iron, so too does the nature of warfare in Iron Age Britain. The era gives rise to a class of warriors distinguished by their iron weapons and armor standing as the defenders of their communities. These warriors, trained in the arts of combat, wield swords, spears and shields with skill and valor. The hill forts serve not only as centers of trade and governance, but also as bastions against invasion. Skirmishes between rival tribes and the defense of territories become common, as the people of Iron Age Britain navigate a landscape marked by both cooperation and conflict. The prowess and bravery of these warriors in defending their homes and way of life leave a lasting legacy in the annals of British history. The Iron Age also witnesses the flourishing of the Celtic culture, characterized by intricate art, complex social structures, and the introduction of the chariot. This period is marked by the emergence of distinct tribal kingdoms, each with its own rulers and deities, as recorded by the Romans upon their arrival. The Celts' skills in metalwork are unparalleled, producing exquisite jewelry, weapons, and ceremonial objects that signify wealth, status, and power. Characterized by rich myths, intricate art and complex social structures, 
the Celts breathe life into the lands of Iron Age Britain. Their communities are alive with the rhythm of daily life, against a backdrop of lush landscapes that fuel their connection to nature and the divine. This era marks the blossoming of a culture that intertwines the spiritual and the material, where art and daily life are inseparable and the natural world is imbued with profound meaning. The Celts' unparalleled skills in metalwork set them apart in the Iron Age. Their artisans, gifted with an eye for beauty and detail, forge metals not just into tools and weapons, but into masterpieces of art. Jewelry such as torques, intricately designed shields and swords are not mere possessions, but symbols of wealth, power, and connection to the divine. Each piece tells a story, showcasing the artisan's skill and the rich cultural backdrop from which it springs. The Celts' craftsmanship extends beyond the functional, entering the realm of the magical and mystical, where objects are imbued with significance far beyond their material value. Among the many innovations of the Celtic period, the introduction of the chariot stands out as a symbol of speed, power, and prestige. These formidable vehicles, drawn by swift horses, thunder across the land, serving both as tools of war and symbols of status among the Celtic elite. Warriors, skilled in the art of chariotry, maneuver these vehicles with precision and grace, demonstrating their prowess in battles and ceremonies alike. The chariot becomes a defining feature of Celtic warfare, a means to awe and intimidate, as well as a cherished possession that elevates the warriors standing within the tribe. The Celts' lives are deeply entwined with their beliefs, with rituals and ceremonies that honor the land, the gods, and the intricate cycles of nature. This spiritual connection permeates every aspect of their existence, from the battles they fight to the art they create, reflecting a world where the material and the mystical are inextricably linked. Despite the absence of written records from the Celts themselves, archaeological discoveries, such as the exquisite Snettisham hoard and the mystifying bog bodies, offer us glimpses into their world. These finds reveal a society rich in ritual and symbolism, with a deep reverence for the natural and the supernatural world. The Iron Age in Britain is a story of innovation and resilience, a prelude to the dramatic changes that would come with the arrival of Rome. In 43 AD, the Roman Empire under Emperor Claudius launches a formidable military campaign to conquer Britain. This marks the beginning of nearly 400 years of Roman presence in the British Isles. The Roman legions, equipped with superior military technology and organization, gradually subdued the diverse Celtic tribes. The Romans established their authority through a network of forts, roads and towns, fundamentally altering the landscape and laying the foundations for Roman Britain. The Roman conquest brought more than just military might to Britain. It introduced a new way of life. The Romans embarked on an ambitious project to Romanize the island, building roads that connected towns and military outposts, facilitating trade and communication. Bathhouses, a symbol of Roman civilization, became centers of social life, while grand villas dotted the countryside, showcasing the prosperity and Roman way of life adopted by the local elite. Roman towns, such as Londinium, London, emerged as vibrant centers of governance, economy and culture, drawing people from across the empire and beyond. In the golden age of Roman Britain, the land thrives under the benevolent shadow of the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. This era witnesses a blossoming of culture and economy, creating a vibrant mosaic of Roman and indigenous peoples living together. Markets bustle with traders from across the empire, offering goods from distant lands. Farms prosper under Roman agricultural techniques, feeding a growing population. This period is not defined by conquest, but by the integration and mutual enrichment of cultures, with Roman Britain emerging as a rich multicultural society, showcasing the power of peace over the sword. The economy of Roman Britain stands on three robust pillars, agriculture, mining and trade. The fertile lands of Britain, enhanced by Roman farming techniques, produce bountiful harvests, ensuring food security and surplus for trade. Beneath the earth, Miners extract valuable resources like lead, silver and tin, vital to the empire's economy. Trade networks extend like arteries throughout the empire, pumping wealth and goods across the land and sea, connecting Britain to the Mediterranean world and beyond. This economic foundation not only sustains the Roman presence in Britain, but also fosters a period of unprecedented growth and stability. In 122 AD, 
the construction of Hadrian's Wall begins, a monumental undertaking that symbolizes the height of Roman power and the recognition of its limits. Stretching from coast to coast across northern England, this formidable barrier serves dual purposes, as a defense against the unconquered tribes to the north and as a point of contact and trade. The wall, with its forts, towers and gates, becomes a symbol of Roman engineering prowess and a physical manifestation of the empire's boundary. Yet it is also a bridge, facilitating interactions and exchanges between the Roman south and the northern lands, embodying the complexities of empire and frontier life. The legacy of Roman Britain, underpinned by the Pax Romana, resonates through the ages, reflecting a time when peace fostered a flourishing of culture, economy and society. The remnants of Roman roads, baths and Hadrian's Wall still mark the landscape, silent witnesses to a bygone era of prosperity and integration. Modern Britain, with its legal and social structures, owes much to its Roman past, a foundation built on the ideals of governance, citizenship and cultural exchange. By the 4th century, the vast Roman Empire, which had once stretched from the sandy deserts of Africa to the misty shores of Britain, found itself grappling with mounting internal and external pressures. Political instability, economic crises and relentless barbarian invasions gnawed at the empire's foundations. In Britain, the situation grew increasingly precarious as Roman legions, the guardians of Roman peace and order, were recalled to defend frontiers closer to the heart of the empire. The departure of these forces left a power vacuum, signaling the beginning of the end for Roman authority in the Isles and casting a long shadow of uncertainty across the land. The withdrawal of Roman troops from Britain marks a turning point. The intricate network of Roman roads, once bustling with commerce and patrolled by Roman legions, falls into disrepair. Towns and cities, built on the backbone of Roman civil administration and protection, begin to crumble under the weight of neglect. The absence of Roman military might open the floodgates to raids by pirates and incursions from restless northern tribes, plunging the island into a period of turbulence and fear. The people of Britain, left to fend for themselves, face the daunting task of reorganizing their defenses and governance, marking the onset of a dark and uncertain era. As the Roman shadow recedes from Britain, the vacuum it leaves is filled not by a single force, but by a mosaic of emerging powers. Local leaders, once Roman allies or officials, now assert their independence, rallying their communities for survival and dominance. This fragmentation leads to the birth of numerous small kingdoms, each with its own ruler, laws and ambitions. These fledgling states, built on the remnants of Roman Britain, lay the foundations for the complex fabric of regional identities that will eventually coalesce into the nations we know today. Amidst this upheaval, the stage is set for new players to enter the fray, reshaping the destiny of Britain. Into this fragmented and vulnerable Britain come new actors, the Anglo-Saxons. Seafarers and warriors from the lands that are now Germany, Denmark and the Netherlands, they arrive in their longships, seeking land and opportunity. Their arrival is not marked by a singular invasion, but by a series of settlements and engagements with the local communities. Some territories welcome these newcomers, integrating them through marriage and trade, while others resist, setting the stage for centuries of conflict and assimilation. The Anglo-Saxons bring with them new customs, languages and governance, planting the seeds for what will become the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, forever altering the cultural and political landscape of Britain. The initial settlements of the Anglo-Saxons grow and expand as families become tribes and tribes become kingdoms. The landscape of Britain transforms once again, this time under the banners of Northumbria, Mercia, Wessex and East Anglia, each a kingdom with its own ruler, laws and customs. These early Anglo-Saxon kingdoms navigate a complex web of alliances and rivalries, both with each other and with the remaining Britain kingdoms. Through trade, marriage and sometimes conflict, they carve out their territories, laying the groundwork for the political map of England. This era of expansion and consolidation is a crucible from which a unified identity begins to emerge, shaping the future of the land. As the 6th century unfolds, a new force sweeps across the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, Christianity. The arrival of missionaries, most notably St. Augustine in Kent, marks the beginning of a profound spiritual transformation. 
Kings and chieftains are baptized, their peoples following suit, uniting the disparate kingdoms under a common faith. The landscape, once dotted with pagan shrines and sacred sites, sees the rise of crosses and churches, symbols of the new belief system. This conversion to Christianity not only binds the kingdom spiritually, but also fosters a rich cultural renaissance, as monasteries become centers of learning, art and literature, creating a new fabric of Anglo-Saxon identity. The Anglo-Saxon period, particularly following the conversion to Christianity, witnesses a blossoming of culture that rivals the achievements of the continent. Monasteries and churches become the heart of communities, not just spiritual centers but hubs of artistic and literary activity. The illumination of manuscripts, the crafting of intricate jewelry, and the construction of stone churches in the Romanesque style speak to a society rich in creativity and skill. The discovery of the Sutton Hoo ship burial with its treasures and artifacts underscores the sophistication and depth of Anglo-Saxon craftsmanship and belief. This cultural flourishing lays the foundations for England's rich heritage, a legacy of art, literature and architecture that continues to inspire and awe. The late 8th century marks a turning point in Britain's history as dark sails appear on the horizon, the Vikings. These fierce Norse warriors, hailing from the rugged landscapes of Scandinavia, set their eyes on the wealth and fertile lands of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. The raid on the Lindisfarne Monastery in 793 heralds the start of this tumultuous era, with Viking raiders pillaging sacred sites and villages, leaving a trail of destruction in their wake. This is not merely a series of raids, but the beginning of a wave of invasions that would reshape the British Isles. By the mid-9th century, the Vikings shift from raiders to settlers, carving out the Danelaw, a swath of England under Norse control. This new geopolitical landscape is not just a zone of occupation, but a melting pot where Norse and Anglo-Saxon cultures intertwine. Norse laws, language and customs blend with those of the Anglo-Saxons, creating a unique cultural and legal blend. The Danelaw stands as evidence of the Vikings' lasting impact on England, a period of conflict giving way to coexistence and cultural exchange. Amidst the fragmentation and despair, a beacon of hope emerges in Wessex, under the leadership of Alfred the Great. Facing the seemingly unstoppable Viking advance, Alfred adopts a strategy of retreat and resistance. From the marshes of Somerset, he wages a guerrilla campaign against the invaders, biding his time and strengthening his forces. This culminates in the Battle of Eddington in 878, a turning point where Alfred's army, fueled by a fierce determination to preserve their kingdom, defeats the Vikings in a decisive confrontation. Alfred's victory is a symbol of resilience, laying the foundation for the survival and eventual unification of England. Alfred the Great's legacy extends far beyond his military victories. In the wake of his successful defense of Wessex, Alfred secures a treaty that recognizes the Dane law but also safeguards his kingdom. He initiates an ambitious program to fortify his realm, establishing a network of fortified towns that serve as military and economic centers. Beyond his strategic and administrative reforms, Alfred fosters a cultural renaissance, promoting education, law, and the arts. He lays the groundwork for a navy, foreseeing the importance of sea power in defending and uniting his kingdom. Alfred's vision and reforms pave the way for the gradual unification of England, making him not just the King of Wessex, but a foundational figure in the creation of a unified English nation. In the 10th century, the legacy of Alfred the Great finds new strength in his grandson, Æthelstan. Crowned amid the hopeful gaze of his subjects, Æthelstan embarks on a mission to complete his grandfather's vision, a unified England. Through shrewd diplomacy and strategic marriages, he cements alliances with the remaining Anglo-Saxon kingdoms and beyond. His reign is characterized by a strengthening of royal authority, the promotion of law and order, and efforts to foster a singular national identity. Æthelstan's rule marks a pivotal moment in the fabric of English history, weaving together disparate threads into a single unified kingdom. The unity of England under Æthelstan faces its greatest test at the Battle of Brunanburh in 937. Here, on a battlefield soaked with the ambition of kings and the blood of warriors, Æthelstan's forces confront a formidable coalition of Vikings, Scots and Strathclyde Britons. The battle rages with a ferocity that echoes the tumultuous history of the British Isles. In the end, Æthelstan emerges victorious, his triumph at Brunanburh not just a military victory, 
but a crucible in which the concept of a unified England is irrevocably forged. This momentous victory cements Ethelstan's legacy and marks the dawn of a new era in English history. As the 11th century unfolds, England's unity and resolve are once again challenged by the spectre of Viking conquest. The ambitious Harald Hardrada, King of Norway, sets his sights on the English throne, launching a series of bold incursions into England. The Norsemen, seasoned warriors of the sea, bring with them the promise of plunder and the ambition of kingship. England braces itself for a conflict that rekindles the fires of its Viking past, a reminder of the fragile balance between peace and war in the medieval world. The stage is set for a decisive confrontation at the Battle of Hastings in 1066. Duke William of Normandy, claiming the English throne by distant blood and broken promises, lands on English soil with a formidable force. King Harold II, fresh from repelling Hardrada's Norse invaders, turns south to face this new threat. The battle that ensues is a clash of epochs, with Harold's shield wall facing William's cavalry and archers. The fall of Harold, struck down by an arrow, marks the end of Anglo-Saxon dominance in England and the beginning of Norman rule. The Battle of Hastings stands as a watershed moment in English history, ushering in a new dynasty, culture and era. The year 1066 becomes a fulcrum upon which the fate of England pivots, as the Battle of Hastings unfolds with brutal clarity. Here, William of Normandy, with his eye on the English crown, engages the weary forces of King Harold II, who had just faced another formidable foe in the north. The Normans' tactical feints and the relentless push of their cavalry break the English shield wall, leading to Harold's death and sealing the fate of Anglo-Saxon England. This day of destiny irrevocably alters the course of English history, ushering in a new era under Norman rule. In the aftermath of his victory, William the Conqueror and his successors embark on a monumental campaign to reshape England, not just through governance, but in stone and mortar. Castles with their imposing keeps and battlements spring up across the land, serving as stark symbols of Norman authority and military might. Meanwhile, the grandeur of Norman cathedrals and abbeys, with their towering arches and divine beauty, speak to a spiritual conquest. This architectural revolution not only fortifies Norman control, but also ushers in a new era of artistic and cultural expression within England, forever altering its skyline. In 1086, William the Conqueror commissions an unprecedented undertaking, the compilation of the Domesday Book. This extensive survey, unparalleled in medieval history, catalogues every acre of land, every resource, and every landholder in England. It is a colossal effort to assess the wealth of the nation, ensuring efficient taxation and reinforcing the feudal system. The Domesday Book stands as a testament to Norman organizational prowess and a foundational document for the centralized governance of England. Through this record, the Normans impose a new order, binding the land and its people to the crown in a way never before seen. The Norman conquest ushers in more than a change of rulers, it catalyzes a profound transformation of English society and its place in the wider world. The imposition of feudalism redefines land ownership and social hierarchy, while the integration of Norman legal practices with existing Anglo-Saxon laws creates a more unified system of governance. English culture and language begin to absorb and adapt Norman influences, leading to the emergence of a new, distinctly English identity. As England becomes more entwined with the political and cultural fabric of continental Europe, it lays the groundwork for its future as a powerful and influential nation on the world stage. The Anglo-Saxon and Viking Age is a saga of migrations, battles, and the blending of cultures that shaped the foundation of modern England. This era of warriors, scholars, and kings forged a nation out of diverse peoples and traditions, leaving a legacy that still resonates in the English identity today. In 1154, Henry II ascends the throne, inaugurating the Plantagenet dynasty that will steer England through an era of profound change and expansion. This period is characterized by efforts to consolidate royal authority, establish legal reforms, and lay the foundations of a system that balances the powers of the monarchy with the rights of its subjects. The Plantagenets oversee the blossoming of Gothic architecture, with cathedrals soaring skyward as beacons of faith and power, mirroring the dynasty's ambition to leave an indelible mark on the land and its people. As 1215 dawns, the air in England is thick with tension and unrest. 
King John's reign has been marked by heavy taxation, military failures and arbitrary justice, fueling a growing discontent among the nobility. The barons, burdened by the king's demands and angered by his disregard for traditional rights, find common cause in opposition. United by their grievances, they begin to rally, forging an alliance that challenges the very foundation of John's authority. The realm stands on the brink, with the spectre of rebellion looming over the land, setting the stage for a confrontation that will alter the course of history. In June 1215, the meadows of Runnymede become the unlikely stage for a momentous event. Here, beneath the open sky, King John and the rebellious barons convene to negotiate an end to the crisis. The result of these tense negotiations is the Magna Carta, a document that embodies the barons' demands for justice and the limitation of royal power. With his seal, King John concedes to these terms, not fully grasping the magnitude of his act. The Magna Carta, initially a peace treaty, transcends its immediate purpose to become a symbol of liberty and the rule of law, challenging the notion of absolute monarchical power and laying the groundwork for constitutional governance. The Magna Carta's significance grows with each passing year, echoing through the corridors of time as a beacon of liberty and justice. Its principles of legal rights, due process, and the accountability of rulers become foundational elements of English law and inspire movements for democracy and human rights around the world. From the English Civil Wars to the American Revolution, the Magna Carta serves as a touchstone for those seeking to affirm the rights of the governed over their governors. Its legacy is a testament to the enduring power of written law to challenge tyranny and protect the liberties of the people, marking the beginning of a gradual but irreversible shift towards parliamentary democracy and the rule of law. The signing of the Magna Carta is not the end but the beginning of a profound transformation in English governance. Over the centuries, the principles enshrined in this historic document guide the evolution of political institutions leading to the establishment of parliamentary democracy. The struggle for power between the crown and its subjects continues, marked by tumult and reform, but the trajectory is clear. A system emerges where governance is shared, laws are made by elected representatives, and the rights of individuals are protected by the constitution. The Magna Carta, once a charter of liberties for the medieval nobility, becomes the foundation stone of democratic governance, reflecting the aspiration for a society where power is tempered by law and the voices of the people are heard. In the year 1348, an invisible menace breaches the shores of England, marking the start of the Black Death. Originating from distant lands, this virulent plague enters through the bustling ports, insidiously weaving its way into the heart of towns and cities. The disease spreads with terrifying speed, leaving communities reeling in its wake. As the death toll mounts, confusion and fear grip the population, challenging the very foundation of medieval society. The initial days of the plague are marked by a desperate struggle to understand and combat an unseen enemy that respects no boundary or status. As the Black Death ravages England, the fabric of society begins to unravel. Towns and villages, once vibrant centers of community life, are transformed into ghostly shadows of their former selves. The disease shows no mercy, claiming the lives of rich and poor alike, decimating entire families and leaving communities in mourning. Traditional structures of support and governance falter under the weight of the catastrophe, unable to stem the tide of death or provide solace to the bereaved. The grim specter of mortality looms large over the land, challenging long-held beliefs and forcing a re-evaluation of life, faith and the social order. In the wake of the Black Death, England emerges as a land transformed. The catastrophic loss of life results in acute labor shortages, dramatically increasing the value of labor and empowering the surviving workforce. Peasants and laborers, once bound to the land under the rigid constraints of feudalism, now find themselves in a position to negotiate wages and conditions. This newfound leverage marks the beginning of the end for the feudal system, as traditional bonds of service and loyalty are redefined the social and economic landscape of England shifts, setting the stage for significant changes in the relationship between the nobility and the peasantry and planting the seeds for future conflicts and reforms. The Black Death, though a tragedy of unimaginable proportions, becomes a catalyst for profound change in England. 
The social upheaval and economic shifts prompt a questioning of established authorities and traditional values as people seek to make sense of the chaos and loss. The move towards a more money-based economy accelerates, undermining the foundations of the feudal order and encouraging the growth of towns and trade. Amidst the despair, the seeds of proto-democratic and reformist ideas begin to take root. As the populace, empowered by their critical role in the post-plague recovery, starts to envision a different future. The Black Death, in its horror, inadvertently sets England on a new course, reshaping its society, economy and political landscape in ways that will echo through the centuries. As England emerges from the shadows of the Black Death, revitalized by profound social and economic transformations, the nation finds itself on the brink of a new era. The catastrophic loss and subsequent recovery had fostered a burgeoning sense of national identity and an empowerment of the populace, setting the stage for England to assert itself on the international stage. By the mid-14th century, these internal shifts begin to intersect with external ambitions as England's accumulated resources and heightened national consciousness fuel its involvement in escalating European rivalries. The simmering claims to territories and thrones, exacerbated by England's renewed strength and unity, escalate into open warfare with France, marking the commencement of the Hundred Years' War. This protracted conflict, sprawling across generations, pits kings and knights in a fierce struggle for dominance, aiming to redraw the political landscape of Western Europe. The initial clashes of this prolonged conflict lay the groundwork for a series of battles that not only test the resolve and strategies of both nations, but also ignite a flame that would consume the countryside and cast long shadows over both peasantry and nobility. England, propelled by its post-plague recovery and the strategic accumulation of resources, steps boldly into the fray, signalling its rise as a formidable power on the European stage. The Hundred Years' War witnesses a revolutionary shift in the art of war, with the emergence of the English longbow. This formidable weapon, in the hands of skilled archers, becomes the linchpin of English military strategy. At the battles of Crecy and Agincourt, the longbow's power is unleashed, with volleys of arrows decimating the ranks of French knights and signalling a new era in warfare. The longbow's range, rate of fire and piercing capability render the heavily armoured French cavalry vulnerable, upending centuries-old tactics and strategies and elevating the status of the common soldier on the battlefield. As the Hundred Years' War drags on, its toll is not limited to the battlefield. Both England and France bear the brunt of the conflict, with resources drained and landscapes scarred by warfare. The countryside is ravaged, cities are besieged, and the common people, farmers, artisans and townsfolk, endure hardship and suffering. The economic burden of funding the war leads to increased taxation and social unrest, exacerbating tensions between the ruling classes and the populace. The prolonged struggle brings into sharp relief the costs of war, sowing seeds of discontent and desire for change among those who bear its heaviest burdens. Amidst the turmoil and devastation of the Hundred Years' War, a profound transformation takes place within the hearts and minds of the English and French peoples. The prolonged conflict, with its shared sacrifices and struggles, fosters a burgeoning sense of national identity. Allegiances to feudal lords give way to a greater sense of unity and purpose under the banners of the emerging nation-states. This war, marked by bloodshed and heroism, becomes a crucible in which the modern identities of England and France are forged. The concepts of English and French transcend regional and feudal divisions, laying the groundwork for the modern nation-state and reshaping the political and cultural landscape of Europe. The Plantagenet rule spanning from the mid-12th to the late 15th century, is an epoch of dramatic change, characterized by the ebb and flow of royal power, the forging of legal principles, and the struggle against existential threats both at home and abroad. The Magna Carta, the Black Death and the Hundred Years' War are not mere historical footnotes, but pivotal events that shape the trajectory of English history. They challenge the old order, prompt social and economic upheaval, and ultimately contribute to the emergence of a more balanced system of governance. The mid 15th century unfolds with the death of King Edward III, sowing the seeds of discord that would blossom into the Wars of the Roses. The English crown, heavy with the legacy of conquest and conflict, 
becomes the prize in a bitter rivalry between two branches of the royal family, the Houses of Lancaster and York. As nobles and knights pledge their swords to one side or the other, England is drawn into a vortex of ambition and loyalty, with the land itself becoming the chessboard for a deadly game of dynastic power. As the Wars of the Roses rage, England is witness to some of the bloodiest battles on its soil. The fields of Towton, Barnet and Tewkesbury run red with the blood of kinsmen, as each clash brings the kingdom closer to the brink of ruin. The conflict is relentless, with victory offering only brief respite before the next storm of swords. Families are torn asunder and loyalties are tested, as the houses of Lancaster and York fight not only for the throne, but for the soul of England itself. The toll is heavy, with countless lives lost in pursuit of a crown that seems ever elusive, as the nation weeps for the unity it once knew. In the twilight of the Wars of the Roses, a new figure emerges from the shadows of history, Henry Tudor. Claiming descent from the House of Lancaster, Henry becomes the unexpected harbinger of change. With little more than a tenuous claim to the throne and a heart full of determination, he lands in Wales, rallying supporters to his banner. As he marches toward Bosworth, his army grows, drawing to his cause all those who yearn for an end to the bloodshed. Henry Tudor, with the Red Dragon of Wales at his fore, strides into history, seeking not only to claim the crown but to forge a new destiny for England. The Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485 was the final and deciding battle of the Wars of the Roses. In this battle, Henry Tudor's army went up against King Richard III's forces to fight for control of England's throne. The battle was intense, filled with bravery and the clash of swords, but eventually Henry Tudor's side started to win. Richard III, the last king of the Plantagenet dynasty, was killed, losing his crown in the mud at Bosworth. With this victory, Henry Tudor became King Henry VII, starting the rule of the Tudor family. This moment marked the end of the Long Wars and the beginning of a new chapter in England's history, leading into a time of great change and development during the Renaissance and the Reformation. The medieval period in Britain was a time of profound change, characterized by the clash of swords and the clash of ideas. It laid the foundation for the nation we know today, with its rich traditions of governance, law and culture. Henry VIII's reign, 1509-1547, is one of the most dramatic and transformative periods in English history. Known for his six marriages and desperate quest for a male heir, Henry's most enduring legacy was the English Reformation. His dispute with the Pope over his divorce from Catherine of Aragon led to the break from the Catholic Church and the establishment of the Church of England, forever changing the religious and political landscape of the nation. The dissolution of the monasteries not only consolidated the king's power, but also reshaped the social and economic fabric of England, redistributing wealth and land across the realm. Elizabeth Run's reign, 1558-1603, heralds a golden age for England, characterized by relative internal peace, cultural flourishing, and the beginnings of English global exploration. The Elizabethan religious settlement established a moderate form of Protestantism, steering England through the divisive religious conflicts of the time. The defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588 marked England's rise as a formidable naval power, setting the stage for its colonial and trade expansion, this era also witnessed an unparalleled flourishing of English literature, with figures such as Shakespeare, Marlowe and Spencer defining the English Renaissance. Elizabeth's rule solidified the Tudor legacy, leaving a transformed nation poised on the brink of the modern era. The Tudor period was a crucible of change, ushering in the modern age with its shifts in religion, society and the arts. It laid the groundwork for Britain's role on the global stage and shaped the identity of the nation for centuries to come. As we close the chapter on the Tudors, we look ahead to the Stuart dynasty, a time of further upheaval and transformation that would challenge the very foundations of the kingdom. In 1603, James the Sussex of Scotland ascended the English throne as James the Fearer, marking the union of the crowns and beginning the Stuart period in England. His reign and that of his successor, Charles the Valor, was marred by escalating tensions between the monarchy and parliament over issues of taxation, religion and governance. Charles of Thrullerman's attempt to rule without Parliament and impose religious reforms sparked the English Civil War in 1642, a brutal conflict that pitted royalists against parliamentarians, 
and divided families and communities across the kingdom. Following the execution of Charles the Lafayette in 1649, England became a republic, known as the Commonwealth, and later the Protectorate under the leadership of Oliver Cromwell. This period of interregnum, a time without a king, saw radical political and social changes, including the abolition of the monarchy and the House of Lords. Cromwell, as Lord Protector, wielded almost regal authority, enforcing Puritan morals upon the society and leading military campaigns to consolidate control over Ireland and Scotland. Despite his efforts to stabilize the nation, Cromwell's death and the failure of his successors to maintain control led to the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. The restoration of Charles II in 1660 was met with widespread celebration, marking the return of the monarchy and the reopening of theatres and pubs closed during the Puritan rule. Charles II's reign saw the rebuilding of London after the Great Fire of 1666 and a resurgence in arts and science. However, the joy was short-lived as his successor James II's overt Catholicism and autocratic rule reignited fears of tyranny. This led to the Glorious Revolution of 1688, a bloodless coup that invited William III of Orange and his wife Mary II, James's Protestant daughter, to take the throne. The subsequent signing of the Bill of Rights in 1689 marked a pivotal moment in English history, limiting the powers of the monarchy and laying the foundations for a constitutional monarchy and a parliamentary democracy. The Stuart period was a time of profound upheaval and transformation, challenging the very notions of monarchy, authority and governance. It set the stage for the modern British state, characterized by a balance of powers between the monarchy and parliament. As we conclude this turbulent chapter, we turn our gaze to the 18th century, an era of enlightenment, empire and revolution that would further shape the destiny of Britain and its empire. The Georgian era, commencing with George Bapesson's accession in 1714, ushers in a period of significant transformation for Britain. This age is characterized by the expansion of the British Empire as it consolidates its power across the globe, establishing a vast network of colonies and trade routes. Meanwhile, the seeds of the Industrial Revolution begin to sprout, radically altering the economic and social fabric of the nation. Innovations in technology, such as the steam engine, ignite a shift from agrarian economies to industrial powerhouses, marking the dawn of a new era in human history. The Regency period, marked by George IV's tenure as Prince Regent, 1811-1820, and then as King, is a time of cultural renaissance and social contrasts. Amidst the backdrop of the Napoleonic Wars, Britain emerges as a dominant global power following the defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo. This era is also renowned for its cultural achievements, with the flourishing of literature, fashion and architecture. Yet, beneath the surface of this cultural bloom lies the tumult of war, social upheaval and the growing pains of industrialization, setting the stage for reform and change in the British society. As the 18th century gives way to the 19th, the Industrial Revolution reaches its zenith, reshaping every aspect of human life. Britain stands at the forefront of this transformation, its cities swelling with the influx of those seeking work in the new factories. The landscape is irrevocably changed, with smokestacks dominating the skyline and railways connecting distant corners of the island. This era of unprecedented economic growth and technological innovation is also a time of social strife, as the working classes face the hardships of factory labor. The clamor for change grows louder, leading to significant social reforms and the gradual improvement of working and living conditions for the burgeoning industrial workforce. The Georgian and Regency periods, with their mix of elegance, empire building, cultural renaissance and industrial might, set the stage for modern Britain. In 1837, a young Queen Victoria ascends the throne, marking the beginning of an era that would bear her name and define a century. Her reign, the longest in British history until that time, is characterized by unparalleled industrial expansion, significant social reform, and the consolidation of the British Empire as the preeminent global power. The Great Exhibition of 1851, housed in the magnificent Crystal Palace, epitomizes the Victorian spirit of progress, showcasing the wonders of industrial technology and the global reach of the empire. Under Victoria's reign, Britain solidifies its status as the workshop of the world. 
The relentless pace of industrialization brings about profound changes, with steam power driving factories and railways, knitting the nation together. British engineering and innovation lead the world, from the steamship lines that link the empire's far-flung territories to the telegraph cables that underpin global communications. This period of industrial might not only fuels the expansion of the British Empire, but also fosters a sense of confidence and destiny among its people. The Victorian era is also a time of stark contrasts and social awakening. Amidst wealth and technological marvels, the plight of the working poor prompts a wave of social reforms. Legislation improves public health, education and workers' rights, reflecting a growing sense of moral responsibility among the Victorian elite. Meanwhile, the British Empire reaches its zenith, encompassing a quarter of the world's land and population. This imperial dominance brings wealth and power, but also responsibilities and challenges, as Britain navigates the complexities of ruling diverse lands and peoples. The Victorian era, spanning the reign of Queen Victoria from 1837 to 1901, is a period of dramatic change, marked by industrial might, social progress, and the vast expanse of the British Empire. As we reflect on this transformative time, we see the foundations of the modern world being laid with Britain at its heart. The legacy of the Victorian age, with its innovations, contradictions and ambitions, continues to influence us, offering lessons and inspiration for the future. The 20th century opens with the cataclysm of World War I, 1914 to 1918, a conflict that redraws the map of Europe and forever alters the course of British history. The war's devastating toll is followed by the interwar period, marked by economic turmoil and the Great Depression, setting the stage for the even greater conflict of World War II, 1939 to 1945. Britain stands firm against the Axis powers, enduring the Blitz with stoic resilience and playing a pivotal role in the Allied victory. These global conflicts, with their immense sacrifices and the triumph of the human spirit, forge a modern Britain, tested by fire, and determined to rebuild. In the aftermath of World War II, Britain faces the daunting task of rebuilding a nation physically and morally devastated by war. The post-war period is a time of significant social reform and reconstruction, exemplified by the creation of the National Health Service in 1948, providing free healthcare to all citizens. Simultaneously, the empire unravels as countries across Africa Asia and the Caribbean achieve independence, marking the end of British colonial rule. Amidst these changes, Britain seeks new roles and relationships on the global stage, culminating in its entry into the European Economic Community, the precursor to the European Union, in 1973, signalling a commitment to a shared European future. As we enter the 21st century, Britain is a nation of contrasts and contradictions, rich in diversity and culture, yet grappling with new challenges. The decision to leave the European Union in 2016, known as Brexit, marks a significant turning point, reflecting deep divisions within British society and uncertainty about the nation's future role in the world. Contemporary Britain also faces global challenges, from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic to the urgent need for action on climate change. Yet amidst these trials, the resilience and creativity of the British people shine through as they navigate the complexities of modern life and strive to forge a path forward in an ever-changing world. If you've been inspired, intrigued or moved by the tales of this great isle, we invite you to like, share and subscribe to our channel. By doing so, you become a part of this ongoing story, helping to carry the legacy of the past into the future. Your support enables us to continue exploring the rich landscape of history uncovering the stories that shape our world. Thank you for joining us on this remarkable journey. The story of Britain, like history itself, is far from over. It evolves with each passing day and together, we look forward to discovering what the next chapter holds. Until then, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep the spirit of history alive.